Brian's Hunt by Gary Paulson. Chapter 2 He glided along the lily pads in the sun, half looking for a fish he might eat, and let his mind float back a couple of months. He had returned to his world, the wilderness. He had sworn that he wouldn't... Once he'd gone back to civilization, even when he found out that once he was 16, he could actually quit school if he wanted to, and his, with his parents' consent. But he didn't want to do that because he had discovered that there was this incredible thing that happened with studying. You learned things. It sounded dumb when he thought of it. Kind of like, duh, really? No kidding. But before the plane crashed, so much of his schooling had been simply getting by, trying to learn just enough to pass the test, and never really knowing anything. When he'd gone back, he started to run into things in books. That, that was how it had happened at first. He'd been in the bush and survived with only a hatchet because he'd begun to try to learn about things that happened to him. Basic things. Even idiotic things. You eat the gut berries. You throw up. Don't eat the gut berries. It sounded silly when he thought of it in that simple way, but when he'd gone back and after the fear fear over his survival was finished with all the television and media hype was done and all the doctors had examined him to make sure he was all right he tried to get his life back to normal but he never really had of co had of course because he had been in a place so completely different he found out that he looked at everything the way he had in the bush when his decisions were a matter of life or death if a teacher handed him a history book he didn't just scan it and learn the dates of the battle of gettysburg or when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. He had a great thirst to understand, to know things as he'd known them in the bush, to really know. And so he tried to find out more about everything that came to him, tried to learn about what happened in Gettysburg, and came to find out that it was not just something in history to take a test about. It was an appalling battle where over 50,000 American soldiers were slaughtered in three days of horrendous fighting, and so thick were the bullets flying at each other that you could still find bullets swagged together because they hit each other in flight and fell to the ground. He learned about the Minnesota First Volunteers, that of 262 who started the battle and only 47 were left standing at the end, and most of those were wounded. And Alexander Graham Bell didn't even invent the telephone. He was actually trying to find a way to help deaf children communicate with their parents and came very close to inventing the airplane before Wilbur and Orville Wright. Brian knew these things. He learned. And though he had come back to, put to the bush now because he couldn't be with the people back in civilization, and because he knew he would probably never fit in, he did not hate school or the concept of studying and learning. He did not hate his parents. He loved them. He wanted to see if there was some way he could make the two worlds work together, but he could not. Their world was ugly to him, and filled with awful tastes and smells, and people who all wanted what he thought were the wrong things. Wanted just that. Things. And money. And the right cars, and the right girls, and the right clothes. At first, he could somehow tolerate how they lived, and he tried to find a way to make it work for him as well. But at the end of two years, he simply could not stand it. He had reached some saturation point where he could not watch television could not listen to discordant loud music, could not stand traffic noise, hated the fact that it was never dark at night, and he couldn't see the stars because of the city light. He went into a state of overload and kind of shock and open disbelief that people could actually live, or pretend to live, the way they did. So he had worked out a way to homeschool on his own up here. He had brought some paperback textbooks with him, one on history, another on math, one on nature and biology, He'd already found some errors in that one, especially concerning how animals think, or even if they do, clinically, think. Several books of literature, and of course his Shakespeare, and he'd promised his parents and the school that after he studied them, he would take a test to prove he knew the things, and then, the next year, he might try more books and more tests. This procedure wasn't openly accepted, but the school's authorities gave him the credit for his surviving 54 days and nothing but a hatchet. They acknowledged that it showed an ability to learn. Everyone was trying to be flexible because it was clear that he did really want to learn. There, he stopped, back paddled the canoe until it didn't move. Under a lily pad, lying still like a small green log, was a large northern pike, four, maybe five pounds, 
In some dumb fishing magazine he'd seen in the doctor's office, he read an article that said northern pike were not good eats because they had a series of floating Y bones down the sides that made it so you couldn't fillet them. Couldn't cut steaks off the side of them very easily. It also said that they were kind of slimy. The truth is all fish are slimy because they're covered in an antibacterial coating to keep disease out. The way Brian cooked them, with the guts out but otherwise whole on a flat piece of wood facing a fire, the slime turned into a nice turned a nice blue and came off with the skin. In a cookbook, he found out the French have a recipe called this called called pike à bleu, where they bake the fish and serve it on a platter blue from the slime. Still, he thought it's a long way from looking at a northern under a lily pad to actually eating one. They were a first class predator, would not just take another fish, but frogs, ducklings, and baby loons and now and then had been known to bite people. Like all good predators, they were very fast and very cautious. Predators could not afford to be hurt. Even a minor in your, in injury was a death sentence, because then they could not catch their prey. They had brought some line, he had brought some line and a few small hooks, but he rarely used them. It was much easier and more selective to shoot fish with a bow, and he even brought a few triple-pointed barbed fish heads glued onto the end of shafts without feathers, just for small fish at very short range. But this was slightly different. The northern was too big for the little fish points because of the spread of the three points. He wouldn't go into the big fish very far and wouldn't just wound it, and the arrows would fall out when the fish thrashed around and would get away. He'd have to get a solid arrow with a field point into the head of the fish to kill it, and he was lined up all wrong for the kill. He was skirting the lake head heading north with the lily pads on the right of the canoe, and since he shot right-handed, it was awkward to pick up the bow and swing to the right and get a shot off without exposing his whole body, which would probably scare the fish away. The same problem existed if he raised himself in the canoe and tried to turn around and face the other way to get a shot. He had the cargo bundle in front of him with all of his gear and was sitting at the rear of the canoe. If he tried to rise and turn, he would undoubtedly scare the fish away. And besides, with all the ways he, he was... with. With the way he was kneeling, and with a small amount of room, it would be almost impossible to turn. Still, it was early in the day, and there was plenty of light left, plenty of time before he stopped for the night. He crouched down toward the front of the canoe, and with careful, extremely slow motions of the paddle, he took almost ten minutes, ten crawling minutes, to turn the canoe around so it was facing the other way. Just like so much of what he did now, so much of how he hunted, it was a stalking procedure. He had learned long ago that to hurry is to lose. Patience is the key, the absolutely most important part of hunting anything, from fish to moose. You needed to take the time required, and when he was learning more about the North Country, he'd read that Inuits hunting seal on the ice would squat over a seal breathing hole for hours, even days, waiting for the seal to come up in the hole to get for air. The Inuit would put a small piece of feather over the hole and stand with a bone harpoon ready, and when the seal came to the hole, came to the hole for air, pushing ahead of its body, would ruffle the feather, and the hunter would lunge with the harpoon and bury the barbed head into the back of the seal. The seal might weigh 400 pounds, and the harpoon didn't kill it, but was merely attached to a line the Inuit was holding. So the whole process was very dramatic, like trying to hold a good-sized bowl with a piece of string. The hunter had to hold the seal with one hand and probe with another killing spear to kill the seal while it was still trying to pull the hunter down through the ice into the water. Needless to say, it didn't always work, and when he read that the hunters were so patient that if the seal never came or they lost it after the first strike, they would not be frustrated but merely shrug and go to the next hole. And Brian learned polar bears hunted seals the same way. The bear waiting by the hole for a seal to come take a breath squinting so its eyes wouldn't give, give it away, and covering its black nose with a white paw for the same reason. And when the seal came, the bear lunged down, grabbing, grabbing it by the nose and pulling the entire three or four hundred pound seal up through the six inch hole in the ice, pulverizing it, turning the insides of the seal to a kind of stew. It took that kind of patience. Brian crouched, peeking over the edge of the canoe at the, no at the northern, all the while barely moving the paddle until the canoe had completely swapped ends. Looking from beneath the water, he hoped like it was slowly drifting and turning log. It must have worked. Once the fish seemed about to move, its back arched and its gills flared, but a smaller northern came by and Brian knew 
he could see it was merely defending its territory. At last the canoe was positioned and the northern was still there, in a slightly better place because the lily pad was partially covering the fish's eyes. The bow was strung and still crouched forward. Brian gently slid a wooden arrow out of his quiver and laid it across the bow, knocked it onto the string, put his left hand on the handle and raised the bow, even with the gunwale of the canoe, then a little higher, so the arrow would just clear the side of the canoe. Then, holding the bow almost sideways, he pushed, pushed it while pulling the arrow back, tucked the feathers under his chin, aimed at the bottom edge of the fish to allow for refraction. He had learned that the hard way by missing the fish when he had first started hunting after the plane crash. He released the arrow. The arrow was slowed only a tiny amount as it traveled through the water and hit the northern with full force just above the right eye. Whether by luck or design, it was an almost perfect shot and the shaft slammed through the brain, cutting the spinal cord, stopping halfway through the northern. The fish, dead in an instant, gave a spasmodic death jerk, a sideways arching of its body which flung it off into the shallower water, perhaps five feet deep. It became still and began to sink, the buoyancy of the wooden shaft slowing the process. Ah! Brian said aloud. I thought it might float. All fish have air bladders, which they use to control their depths, and sometimes when they are killed they have enough air in the bladder to make them rise to the surface. Sometimes, as with this northern, the air is expelled and they sink. Brian was wearing only shorts, and he put one hand on each side of the canoe and lift jumped at himself into the side of, off over the side into the water. He slipped beneath the surface with his eyes open and through his vision was though his vision was blurred and the northern's colors made it almost impossible to see. The arrow shaft was a bright white line. He grabbed it and pulled the fish up to the canoe and flopped it over onto the boat. Thank you, he thought, as he always thought when he killed. And then, good meal. Full meal. What he had come to think of as a can't-walk meal or lie-down-and-sleep meal. He could not save fish in the summer. If he had a smokehouse or a way to dry the meat without flies getting to it, he might be able to keep some. But in the late summer heat with no refrigeration, it was impossible to keep meat for very long. If he tried to, if he tried and ate the spoiled fish, it could easily kill him. He had found a government book on the internet that had been put out for farmers and hunters and trappers back in the 1930s. It cataloged and described each kind of meat and how to raise the different animals and how to slaughter them and pre preserve them. There were many surprises, such as the fact that venison and especially moose meat were very low in nutritional value and protein, while rabbit was the highest. He learned that fish meat was vulnerable to a kind of ptomaine and worse, botulism, which was often fatal. There were documented cases of Native Americans dying from eating dried salmon and other fish because of these poisons. There was also many cases of predators, scavenger birds like eagles and wolves and foxes and coyotes being found dead from eating bad fish that had died and drifted up on shore. So he would eat the whole fish, and when he smiled remembering the first time, first fish, and how small it had been, and how wonderful it had tasted, he still felt the same about it. He still felt wonder at the food, and he looked for a clearing on the bank to make a fire. Good meal. Full meal. Thank you.